It's almost time. No, not that time. Time to worship the King of Kings. Get your Bible, grab your coffee and your family, and let's get ready to worship in just a few minutes.
good morning, welcome, happy new year. Isn't it great to celebrate that 2020 is officially over? Yeah, and 2021 is here. It's like a new beginning. I know I can't be the only one that's excited to put last year behind me and continue into this year with high hopes, right? Um, we've been in the midst of a sermon series called Oh, The Way We Can Go. We broke it up for Christmas, but now we're back um, into finishing that up today. And uh, what we're studying is what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Now, we've been journeying through the book of Mark. This last piece finishes up the last section of Mark that we were looking at. Um, and we just want to invite you to join us this morning and see what it means to follow Jesus in your life. Okay? So um, if you don't know what it means to be a follower of Jesus, reach out to either myself or Pastor Steve. We would love to talk to you and uh, kind of walk you through that and what that means. Um, if you have questions or uh, you just need some guidance, we're here for you. Okay? Um, so let's go ahead and go before God before we worship in music this morning. Oh, Lord, Father God, we are so thankful that we are able to come together this morning and just worship and celebrate you. Uh, we are thankful, Lord, that it is a new year. It is a new start. It is a new day. Lord, you make all things new. And this year, we are looking to you to, to make it better than last year. And Lord, above all else, above our comfort, above our happiness, Lord, we come to follow you, to do your will, to celebrate you, to make you known, to glorify you and what we do. And Lord, as we turn our hearts to you this morning to worship and glorify you, Lord, we just ask that you would join us there, that you would help us, Lord, to have a heart prepared to worship. Lord, Hear our voices lifted to you this morning as we celebrate you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Steve and Gabby as they lead us in worship this morning.
Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. As Pastor Chris mentioned, today we're finishing up uh, our series on the way we can go and it's part of our uh, journey with Jesus and, and learning to follow him what does it mean to be a committed multiplying follower of Jesus so we want to commit ourselves this morning to following him wherever he leads where you go I'll go where you stay I'll stay when you move I'll move I will follow
Hey, just a few announcements for you. Things to be thinking about as we move forward into the new year. Okay, so we've been talking about the importance of community, right? Especially in the midst of uh, social distancing and not being able to meet physically. Um, so one of those things that we want to talk about this morning are all the new, uh, potentially new Bible studies that are coming your way and small groups coming your way this year. I think we have up to possibly four of them starting up soon. Uh, we're still working on the details, but we will continue to have our helping hand small group, which meets on Saturday mornings before church, uh, usually around 930. Uh, we have the Women of the Word. That's our Tuesday's women's Bible study. That starts at 10 a.m. And then um, we have our Wednesday night Bible study. We don't know where we're going with that or that small group. We don't know exactly what that's going to be. And we have potentially another one, the Bible in today's world, where we're going to look at things going on in our world and how do we tackle them as Christians. Um, again, I don't have the details on all of those, but those are potential small groups starting in the next uh, several weeks, possibly in the next month or two. So if any of those tickle your fancy, we'd love to get you connected with the community of believers so that you have community outside of just your um, your, your digital gathering on Saturday mornings. Um, and again, as we're talking about being distanced, um, let me just assure you that this is not a permanent fixture, right? Nobody says the best thing for the church is to be uh, scattered, right? Even though we can gather digitally, it's just not the same. So we are looking, me and Pastor Steve are evaluating what makes the most sense and when will it be the safest um, for everybody involved, our community and ourselves, to return to in-person services. Um, we want to love our community, which is why we are making sure that we're not a vector for disease in our community. So we are evaluating that. We're looking forward to the day that we can come back to in-person gatherings. So uh, we're evaluating what it looks like after the holidays here, uh, what the numbers are going to do, and when it is uh, smartest to come back together. Um, don't forget also that we have opportunities um, to, to reach into our community, to, to, to serve our community. Um, and one of those ways that we're doing that is with uh, Prairie Ridge Elementary School. Um, continue to be praying for Prairie Ridge Elementary School, the teachers and the staff and the students there. Um, as they finish up the year, they're going into the last half of the year now after the holidays. So we want to be mindful of them. And uh, we want to be prayer-filled for them, um, since we've adopted them as one of our community projects. Um, let's go ahead and go before the Lord before we continue in our service this morning. Lord, Father God, Lord, we come to celebrate you this morning. We've celebrated you in song. Lord, we've celebrated you in your scripture. And Lord, we want to continue that by celebrating you in the sermon this morning, Lord. Now, Lord, we pray for Pastor Steve as he preaches this sermon to us this morning. Lord, we also pray that our hearts would be prepared to receive that message this morning, Lord. Lord, would you open our ears and our eyes to what you have for us today? Lord, we want to be committed followers of Jesus. We want to be like Jesus, and we want to do the things that Jesus wants us to do. We want to grow his kingdom in his way alongside of him. So Lord, help us to see how we can be better followers of Jesus this morning. Lord, we lift up to you our community of Carbon Valley. Lord of Firestone, Frederick, and Decono. Lord, we lift up the leaders of each of these cities. Lord, we lift up our neighborhoods. Lord, we lift up our schools, especially Prairie Ridge Elementary. And Lord, we lift up your churches in the area. Lord, we know we're not your only bastion of faith in the community. Lord, we're not the only outpost for grace here. And Lord, we celebrate all of your kingdom work in our doors and outside of our doors, Lord. Lord, we just want to be a part of it. So, Lord, we pray for your family of people here in the Carbon Valley as well. Lord, that we would be people pursuing you. That we would be people pursuing your kingdom. 
Lord, open our eyes to the opportunities in our community. Lord, we also lift up places around the world where Christians are being persecuted. We lift up your believers who are suffering for their faith, who are standing firm in the midst of harm for your name. Lord, we pray for strength for them. We pray for peace for them. We pray for courage for them. And Lord, we pray for this church, for a frontier church, Lord, that we would continue to grow and that we would continue to walk the path that you've laid out for us, Lord. Lord, that we would continue to courageously step forward to wherever you're calling us to go to reach the people that you've set for us to reach. Lord, as we turn to you this morning to hear from your word, Lord, again, soften our hearts, open our ears, and let us be fixed on you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Mark chapter 10, verses 42 through 45. Read along with me, starting in 42. And Jesus called them to him and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But it shall not be so among you. But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Congratulations. Today is your day. You're on a journey with Jesus. You're off and away. You have brains in your head. You have Jesus in your heart. You're on the discipleship path. But oh, where to start? You're not on your own. He'll never leave nor forsake. But in following Jesus, there are lots of choices to make. There are truths to embrace, temptations to flee, denying yourself and picking up your cross. Isn't easy, you see. With faith like a child, be a servant to all, things are possible when we believe in him. Not just some things, but all. So join us on this journey. He'll help us to know when Jesus heals your blindness, Oh, the way we can go. In the middle of World War II, tens of thousands of U.S. and Filipino troops hunkered down in the Bataan Peninsula of the Philippines, waiting for supplies and, more importantly, reinforcements. For months, they held off Japanese attacks, but eventually living off of half rations and dwindling medical supplies, battling malaria, dysentery, and other tropical diseases uh, left them as no match for their enemies. And so on April 9, 1942, Army Major General Edward P. King, rather than see more of his starving, diseased men under his command slaughtered by Japanese forces, surrendered to Japanese General Masaharu Hama, and about 12,000 Americans and 63,000 Filipinos became prisoners of war. What followed became infamously known as the Bataan Death March, one of the worst atrocities in modern warfare history. The men were placed in groups of 100 and forced over the next five days in blistering heat with very little food or water to march 65 miles to their prison camp. Along the way, about 10,000 of them were killed for falling or attempting to escape or just for no reason at all, just as an example to the other prisoners. Well, from there, things didn't get any better as they endured horrific conditions in one camp after another, and eventually the surviving Americans were crammed into the dark holds of cargo ships and taken to Japan. By the time they were liberated, over half the Filipino soldiers and two-thirds of the Americans were dead. Is it any wonder why we resist so strongly the idea of surrender? I don't think it stems from this story or any others that we could tell of abuse. I think it goes to the very root of our pride. 
We can't stand the idea of, of putting our feet in the hands of another, of, of just giving up. Now, whether it be in war or politics or, or something as simple as a sporting event or a game of chess. We hate the idea of surrender. We fight against it to every fiber of our being. But Jesus painted a very different picture of surrender. See, for him, surrender was a path to victory and the only way that God's will could be accomplished. So today we're going to learn that if you want to be a committed, multiplying follower of Jesus Christ, you must learn to walk the path of surrender. Uh, welcome back. Uh, welcome to 2021. And welcome back to uh, Frontier Church and our journey with Jesus through the Gospel of Mark. If you're new to our church, uh, we've been working our way for about a year now through this book, which is an account of the life and mission of Jesus Christ. Uh, it was written down by a man named John Mark, who got a lot of his information from listening to sermons and, and stories from Peter, one of Jesus' closest followers. We call it the journey with Jesus because we believe that becoming committed, multiplying followers of Jesus is a journey that leads us into the frontiers of life, uncharted territory. And to equip us for that journey, we need to learn as much as possible about who Jesus was, what he taught, and what it means to follow him. Our current series is called, Oh, the Way We Can Go, and it's focused here on chapters 8 through 10 of Mark's Gospel, a time where Jesus' ministry uh, began to focus more on his immediate disciples, known as the Twelve, uh, and, and, and he was preparing them for uh, carrying out his mission after he left. We came up one sermon short of being able to finish this series before we took a break for Advent and uh, Christmas, and I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, but today we want to return and finish up this series and get ready to launch into the next one. If you were with us back in October, you may remember that this section of Mark is, is bracketed by two events where Jesus healed two different blind men. Uh, and that was an indication to us that uh, Jesus teachings in this section, uh, he was trying to address the spiritual blindness of his disciples, trying to help uh, uncover their eyes and, and help them to understand all the things they needed to understand to, uh, to carry out his mission. We learned that as we become committed, multiplying followers of Jesus, his desire is that we become spiritually whole and that if we let him he will uh, address our blind spots and shape us into followers who are crucial to his mission. Along the way, we've discovered, uh, first of all, things he wants us to know about who he was and, and about his mission. We've discovered things he wants us to do. And perhaps most important, we've discovered attitudes that he wants us to adopt. This section of Mark uh, the, emphasized that following Jesus is not easy. It's not something you can do halfway or in your spare time. It requires hard work. It requires commitment, a, a deeper understanding, and a willingness to give up some attitudes which may be near and dear to our hearts. One of the biggest of those attitudes which Jesus dealt with in this passage is pride. If you're anything like me, this is an ongoing, lifelong struggle. And it's a struggle where the only way to have victory is to surrender. Victory by humility, we might say. If you want to be a committed, multiplying follower of Jesus Christ, you must learn to walk the path of surrender. But as we say that, we also need to recognize some things about surrender. See, Often we think of surrender as, as, as just completely giving up, uh, as being maybe wimpy and spineless, never standing up for anything. Uh, surrender in Jesus' eyes is quite the opposite. Jesus said, blessed are the meek. And that word meek doesn't mean weak, but it means power under control. 
So following Jesus' perfect example, surrender means resisting the enemy by giving up control of your own desires, uh, your own dreams and ambitions uh, to God's will, choosing the right things to stand up for and doing so in a way that is loving and admirable and attractive, not offensive and controlling. The upside-down attitude Jesus wanted his disciples to adopt in this passage was a shift from me first, which comes so very naturally to us, to kingdom first. So he laid out for them and for us the path of surrender. And we'll see in this passage the path of surrender embraces some key attitudes which are not natural for many of us. In fact, we might find ourselves kicking and screaming against them uh, the way that the soldiers facing the Bataan death march would have. Uh, these attitudes are sacrifice, selflessness, and servanthood. Sacrifice, selflessness, and servanthood. Three key attitudes to the path of surrender. So first, we'll look at that first one, sacrifice. The path of surrender embraces sacrifice. Look at verse 32 in our passage in Mark chapter 10. If you're not there, go ahead and turn there. We're going to spend some time. We're going to follow right through the passage uh, in Mark 10, starting in verse 32. It says, uh, And they were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. And they were amazed. And those who followed were afraid. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him. Now, twice that we know of already on this journey from the region of Galilee, uh, where Jesus had done so much of his ministry up to that point, uh, and they were traveling from there down to Jerusalem, uh, Jesus had made it at least twice very clear about the fate that awaited him there in Jerusalem. Uh, and in case they missed it, he stated it here in the most clear terms possible. Look at verses 33 and 34. He was saying, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him, and after three days he will rise. First note, he, used, he was very clear about using the term Jerusalem. He wanted to leave no doubt where they were headed. And he says, we are going there. It was not up for debate. We are going to Jerusalem, where uh, he would be delivered over. He uses that twice. First of all, Judas, one of his own followers, would deliver him over to the chief priests and the scribes, who'd been looking for a way to eliminate the threat of Jesus. They, in turn, not willing to risk the wrath of, of the growing crowds who were hearing his teaching and beginning to believe in him, uh, would turn Jesus over to the Gentiles, in other words, the Roman government, who had the power to put Jesus to death. But also, uh, somewhat hidden here, is the fact that ultimately it was God. God who was delivering over his one and only Son to have all of these things happen in fulfillment of his sovereign plan to save the world from itself. So Jesus gets more vivid here. He says that they would mock him, they would spit on him, they would flog him, and they would kill him. Not only would these be typical mistreatments that Jews living under Roman oppression would be fully aware of, uh, but these things were specifically prophesied by Isaiah in his suffering servant blueprint for the Messiah. Take a look at the different attitudes, though, in this traveling part. If we skip back up to verse 32, uh, I want to start last. We see the third attitude was, was fear. Fear, it says, those who followed were afraid. What were they afraid of? Were they afraid of what might happen to Jesus? Possibly. 
uh, more likely they were afraid of what would happen to them, that they might get caught up in whatever conflict Jesus was walking into there in Jerusalem. He was saying some really strange things, and, and it was making them afraid. Some of them may have been disciples of Jesus. Some may have been just curious followers, hoping Jesus would teach or maybe perform some more miracles. Uh, or others may have simply been those who were traveling in the same direction. They were, after all, uh, a lot of Jews were headed to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover at that time. The second attitude, moving back up in the verse then, is the attitude of amazement. Uh, we assume that they there in verse 32 refers to the 12 disciples, those who were closest followers of Jesus. And the word there, amazement, means astonished or astounded, or my favorite one I saw was uh, stupefied, stupefied with surprise. Well, what were the disciples stupefied about? Probably that Jesus would continue to boldly go in the direction of a place where he kept telling them uh, held horrible things in store for him. Uh, betrayal, abuse, death, uh, and resurrection, which they keep seeming to miss that part. But, but they were amazed. They were stupefied. They, they couldn't understand why Jesus would keep heading to Jerusalem. Well, the first attitude I want to note, though, is the one of Jesus. That's courage. Courage. It says he was going ahead of them. It was almost like he was anxious to get to Jerusalem. Jesus fully understood what was waiting for him there. And he was walking ahead of them, like he was looking forward to it or something. This was no reluctant Bataan death march where Jesus was being dragged against his will. This was a deliberate choice that Jesus made to surrender to the greater will of God. Jesus fully understood the sacrifice that he'd been asked to make, to endure rejection, to endure pain, to endure humiliation, to endure agony, to endure a brutal death. Great, great sacrifices Jesus was asked to make. He also knew that this was the only way for his father's plan to succeed. It, it, it was, was for him to completely surrender to these sacrifices he was being asked to make. And so Jesus embraced the sacrifice. He embraced the sacrifice he was asked to make. Now, as followers of Jesus, we are asked to make some sacrifices. For most of us, they're nothing like the sacrifices that Jesus faced, although we should be prepared because I believe that day is coming. But ask yourself this question. In fact, you can answer it in the chat below and you can discuss it amongst yourselves. What are some of the sacrifices that you've been asked to make in order to follow Jesus? What are some of those sacrifices that you have been asked to make? Maybe you think of uh, some of your sinful desires, things that, that, that our flesh really enjoys, but we know runs contrary to the will of God. Maybe it's uh, wealth or some of your possessions you've had to give up in order to give to his work. Uh, maybe your time you've had to sacrifice. Maybe some popularity, or even some of you may have had to sacrifice family and friends in order to follow Jesus. The path of surrender embraces these sacrifices. Now, he didn't say we like it, but we embrace it knowing that this is the way to God's will. This is the way to surrender. But, but knowing that these sacrifices are temporary and they are minimal in compared to being part of God's plan. Make a list of the sacrifices you've made. You don't have to do it now, but, but sometime this week, make a list. I, I challenge you. Make a list of those sacrifices. Make a list of sacrifices that, that you think you'd be willing to make, but maybe haven't been asked to yet. Uh, and then make a list of sacrifices that you may be asked to make, even things you might be afraid to make. And then look through that list, pray through that list, and make a choice of whether you will resist them or whether you will embrace them when they come. The path 
of surrender embraces sacrifice. The second uh, key we saw was selflessness. The path of surrender embraces selflessness. Uh, next in our story, James and John, who were known as the original sons of thunder, uh, and they were part of Jesus' inner circle, made uh, what might seem like a power play. Now, please don't judge me, but recently my wife and I have gotten into watching old seasons of the show Survivor. What's fascinating about it to me is to watch the, the social experiment that takes place there, the, the interactions and the way that, that people uh, uh, change with each other and the lengths to which they will go to deal with or deceive or even manipulate other people uh, and manipulate themselves into positions of power in order to avoid getting voted off. We kind of expect that kind of self-promotion in a, in a game where morals seem to go out the window in pursuit of a million dollars. But that's not the kind of behavior we expect to see from Jesus' closest followers, is it? And yet there in verse 35, here come James and John saying, Jesus, we know we're some of your favorites, so will you do anything we ask? Jesus responded to that in verse 36, probably the same way I would when I'm asked, hey, will you do anything? Will you grant me a favor? And he says, you're going to have to tell me what it is first before I can agree to that. <laughs> verse 37, James and John says, we want the positions of power. We want to sit at your right hand and your left hand when you ascend to the throne. Well, Jesus flips the script on them. Uh, in verse 38, Jesus says to them, you do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? Now, he's using imagery there. The cup that he's talking about is an image of the suffering that he would face as he entered into Jerusalem, specifically the cup of God's wrath, which is talked about in the Old Testament prophets, um, in, when, in which he would have to take the penalty of our sins upon himself and face the cup of God's wrath. All this suffering. And then when he talks about baptism, it's not baptism the way that we would typically think of it, or even probably the way the disciples would think of it. I mean, they'd seen the baptism of John. They knew that. But Jesus was obviously talking about something different here. He was using it to describe the death into which he would soon be immersed. He's saying to them, are you ready to suffer and die with me on behalf of the kingdom? Well, James and John, perhaps not fully understanding and, and definitely more focused on their self-promotion, said in verse 39, yep, absolutely, whatever it takes, Jesus, we're your guys. And Jesus says to them, perhaps ironically somewhat, in verse 39, the cup that I drink, you will indeed drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. He's saying, you're right. You will suffer and die on my behalf. And, and scripture and history bear that out uh, and tell us some of the stories of, of the physical and emotional trials that James and John and, and some of the other disciples would face and endure in the years to come. But <laughs> there had to be a but, didn't there? In verse 40, but to sit at my right hand or my left is not mine to grant, Jesus says but it is for those for whom it is prepared. And, and he just leaves it hanging there. He's not even going to tell them. You know? He's not even going to hint at it. He's just going to say, that's not my choice, but you will suffer and you will die with me. Well, not only did they still not understand that Jesus' kingdom, uh, at least for the time being, would, would not be a physical kingdom, but even worse, James and John missed the point that there is no place for self in God's kingdom. No place for self. Jesus was saying, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to set self aside. It's great that you're willing to suffer and even to die for me, 
embrace the sacrifice, right? But if you're going to do it because you think in some way you're going to get ahead, uh, if you're going to in some way serve your own selfish motives by doing that, that's not it. You're going to have to set yourself aside Well, in verse 41, we see the other disciples overheard all of this, and they were indignant. They couldn't believe the audacity of James and John to ask for such a thing. Now, unfortunately, it probably wasn't because the other disciples understood there's no place for self in the kingdom, but rather because they didn't think of it first. (laughs) They were probably jealous uh, that James and John had beaten them to the punch, that they were trying to sneak in there and get the right and left hand before they had a chance. Jesus taught, and more importantly, demonstrated over and over again for his disciples, there is no place for self in the kingdom. He asked us, his followers, to embrace selflessness, even as he himself had embraced selflessness. In Philippians 2, Paul also urged Jesus' followers to adopt Jesus' attitude. And what was that attitude? We read in verses 6 through 8 of Philippians 2, uh, Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Selflessness. It's a key attitude for a follower of Jesus. And again, it runs contrary to our human nature. But the only way this following Jesus works is if we're willing to set self aside and seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. The path of surrender embraces selflessness. Well, what does that look like? It looks like giving up my own will for the sake of his will. Giving up my hopes and dreams uh, and what I may think to be my rights, uh, maybe of being noticed, of being important, of being rewarded. It's not worrying about what's best for me or my own self-interest. As Paul put it uh, earlier in Philippians 2, it's doing nothing out of selfish ambition or arrogance, but choosing to humble ourselves for the sake of others. This requires us, first of all, to choose humility. Choose humility, which, which means we're elevating God's status, elevating Jesus' status in our lives, and, and lowering our own status. It requires us, second of all, to check our motives, uh, to check them honestly and check them constantly, to make sure that self doesn't sneak back in. And third, it requires us to put Christ and his kingdom first in our lives. The path of surrender embraces selflessness. Third of all, the path of surrender embraces servanthood. Jesus pulled the disciples together at that point to explain to them what he had told them before. Uh, a lot of the things about the kingdom of God are, are flipped on their heads. They're, they're upside down compared to the way the world thinks. In verse 42, he says, You know that those who are considered rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, uh, and their great ones exercise authority over them. But that's not the way it works with us, Jesus said. I know it's human nature, but it has to be different with us. Look at what Jesus said, this key teaching in verses 43 and 44. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first among you must be slave of all. He had told them this before, uh, but he wanted, it was such a hard teaching. Uh, And it was so crucial to the mission, he wanted to make sure that they got it. Whoever would be great among you must be your servant. The first is last. If you want to be first, you must be a slave to all. And then he emphasized it with his own example. Even I, myself, the Son of Man, came not to serve, excuse me, came not to be served 
but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The greatest man that ever lived, God in human flesh, the one most deserving in the history of mankind of being exalted and lifted up and served, became a servant to the point where he laid down his life to save us. That word ransom means to, to buy us back. And that's what he did when he served us by being obedient to his death on the cross. That's our example. That's our mentor. This is the man that, that we've chosen to follow. That's our blueprint to honoring God with our lives. Servanthood. The setting aside of self. How do we do that? We do that by devoting our time, talents, energy, and resources to, to being God's hands and feet in the world. Uh, we do that by, by working to accomplish his tasks, by being obedient to the things he asks us to do. We do that by proclaiming his message, the message of the gospel, everywhere that we can to the ends of the earth, by extending his glory to the ends of the earth. We do that by working to meet the needs of the least of these. Uh, we, we, we are asked, in, in essence, to approach life with a Chick-fil-A worker mentality. It is my privilege and pleasure to serve. Embracing, sacrifice, selflessness, and servanthood. Let's be honest. That's not an easy way to live. That's not an easy way to live. The path of surrender is hard. And I tell you this not to scare anyone away, but to make sure we understand what we signed up for when we signed up to follow Jesus. Why would anyone ever choose this life, you may be asking? Jesus never promised it would be easy, did he? But he did promise it would be worth it that it would be more than worth it. You see, through his death and resurrection, Jesus offers us some things. He offers us freedom from both the penalty and the bondage of sin. He offers us an, an, an eternal restored relationship with the God of the universe. And he offers us an abundant life here on earth, filled with the joy, peace, hope, and love of knowing that we are fulfilling God's purpose for our lives. In exchange, he asks us to walk the path of surrender, to follow him on the path of surrender. If you've never made that exchange uh, or, or, or understood Christianity in that way, I want to encourage you to reach out to me, to me or, or, or someone else from the church. Um, you, can, you can email me, you can text me, you can, you can message, message me on Facebook, call me up on the phone. Um, please reach out because I want to help you in that. More importantly, I want to challenge you to reach out to him, to reach out to him and, and ask him to, to uh, help you understand what that exchange is all about. If you want to be a committed, multiplying follower of Jesus Christ, you must walk the path of surrender. This is no Bataan death march. This is the most rewarding, most fulfilling sacrifice you will ever make. The most fulfilling surrender that we can possibly make in our lives to bring him glory and to live out his purpose for our lives. Let's walk the path of surrender together. Father, we are thankful. <laughs> Seems odd maybe to be thankful that you've challenged us and, and called us to sacrifice and, and set aside self and, and embrace servanthood. But Lord, we're thankful that, that you counted us worthy to be a part of your plan and that you offer us so much in exchange that you offer us the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. But Lord, we know that in exchange, you ask us for everything we have, everything that we are, everything we ever hope to be. 
So Lord, we ask for strength and courage. That's not an easy thing, and we don't want to take it lightly. We want to check ourselves constantly and make sure that we're setting aside self and pursuing you, that we're seeking first your kingdom. Father, give us strength, give us courage to follow Jesus everywhere he leads in life, especially on the path of surrender. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's close by by asking him to continue to build our lives into lives that honor him.
join me as we get ready to go into the world this week? We are committed multiplying followers of Jesus Christ. Reaching up, reaching in, and reaching out. Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, we press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called us heavenward in Christ Jesus. Go in peace and be blessed.